I'm Yaron Warber, Biotechnology Analyst at Cowan, and we're kicking off 2023 here in San Francisco, where I'll be interviewing management teams from four biotechs to talk about opportunities, challenges, and the reimbursement outlook when launching innovative therapies for oncology and immunology. Join me. I'm talking today with Murdo Gordon, Executive Vice President of Global Commercial Operations at Amgen, Ying Wang, CEO of Legend Biotech, Keith Woods, Chief Operating Officer at Orgenix, Josh Nyman, Senior Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer in North America and Europe of Beijing. What are some of the challenges to launching innovative drugs globally in the current environment? We start first with, do we have a molecule that's best in class or first in class? So it needs to be differentiated or it needs to be first to the market. Then you have to consider, is it a novel category, a new disease area? Do physicians have baseline knowledge and understanding of that disease area? What about access? And what about your global scale? We took an approach that we needed to be able to get to the patients, right? We needed to be able to provide education to them to where they would be demanding better therapy. And so we did this with direct to consumer. We did this by working through social media so that the patients would be asking, is Vivgard the right choice for me? Having a really good product is, is, is one thing, uh, but we've been preparing for this moment and really building, building a team to ensure that we can bring the promise of Brukinza and the benefit that it portends to, to patients. You know, I think that's, that's, that's really critical because uh, you're going up against established companies. Mm -hmm. and if you don't have the right infrastructure in place, the right teams, it can be really challenging. We have to educate the physicians and uh, also the patients. Uh, what CAR T is and how um, to use a CAR T and also what are benefits and also side effects with CAR T. So that's one challenge. And the other one is obviously we have to overcome the supply constraint. Um, I think those are two main challenges we're facing. Yeah, so to your point, demand for Corvicti has been very, very strong. Manufacturing a CAR T in the early stages is challenging. It takes time to, uh, to ramp up supply. What is J&J and Legend doing that globally right now to, to address demand? So first of all, we're investing heavily in both our New Jersey facility in the States and also our facility in Ghent, Belgium. And our hope is that by the end of 2025, we'll exit that year with a combined capacity of more than 10,000 doses per year. So that's what we're doing. In addition, we're also bringing the Lenti vector uh, production in the house. And, and why is that important? Why is having Lenti supply important in-house? Well, as you may have known already, there's a global shortage of lentivector across the board. Uh, first of all, there are so many gene and cell therapies that are being developed today. So there's a shortage already because there are only a handful of GMP-grade lenti providers. Secondly, in the last couple of years, it was exacerbated by the production of mRNA vaccine, which also takes up the slots. Amgen is also a leader in biosimilars. You have multiple brands on the market. You've captured a tremendous amount of share very quickly uh, in the oncology setting. And you are about to launch the first uh, drug that's going to be targeting Humira's, uh, Abby's Humira, which is a huge brand, and that's coming up in February. What is Amgen doing to prime the market for that launch? In the U.S., it's going, going to be different because this is the first Part D product that we're seeing um, go off. And so this, this kind of retail PBM business has got some you know, uniqueness to it that you need to understand to understand what that uptake will be. Now, we're establishing that access by negotiating with those PBMs right now. Uh, we think we'll have good broad parity coverage at launch. And then it's really the you know, the, the 40 years of biologics manufacturing experience, the fact that we're already in inflammation in that category with Enbrel and with Otesla, and having both medical people and salespeople on the ground calling on those customers and having all the patient support services, we market our biosimilars alongside our innovative products. So same rep selling Enbrel will sell Amgevita. Mm. And so that pull through, that ability to generate demand for the product should be, I think, an advantage to Amgen versus, say, some of the other biosimilar manufacturers. Beijing, as you mentioned, is about to launch Burkinza, pending FDA approval shortly for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, a blood cancer. Uh, you've shown superiority to the market leader. It's a $10 billion market. The market leader is selling $7 billion. Uh, why is Burkinza so important for Beijing globally? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't begin by saying why is it so important for patients, right? Uh, you, you really hit it on the head right there. Um, 
Bukinza is the first BTK inhibitor to show a superiority from an efficacy standpoint. Certainly from a, a revenue standpoint, there's a lot for us to realize as a company. And that's really critical uh, because if you're familiar with Beijing as a company, if you've been following us for years, you know, we're not here just to bring Bukinza to patients. It's a, it's a tremendous medicine. We're really looking forward to, to expanding our efforts there. But we have a really deep commitment to developing many, many more you know, molecules and advancing them through the clinic, eventually getting them to approval, that's expensive, right? That takes significant investment. And so the revenue that we're going to be able to generate from our commercial success, you know, with the seal launch with, with, with Rukinza is really critical for fueling our ambitions uh, across our pipeline, allowing us to have an even greater impact for, for patients globally. So Vivcord is actually a success story in terms of when you launch, you automatically got very broad coverage with your VBA value-based agreements and most of the payers signed up. How did you manage that process? You know, the old way was to, you'd launch your product, you'd announce your price, they'd express their dissatisfaction with you, then you'd go back and you'd negotiate. We went in in advance and we had conversations. We shared the data with them up front. Uh, then we talked about what we thought was the right value and what they thought was the right value. And we were able to pull some levers between the price that we then later set and the value-based agreements. One of the special things about VivGuard, it reduces autoantibodies and autoimmune disorders. And so there's potentially 15 indications you've talked about going into. How do you prioritize which one you start with? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the potential for VivGuard, we're already now working in 13 indications. We've said 15 by 2025. We have a simple platform that we use to make these decisions. First and foremost is the biological rationale. We work with academic experts, people that have worked in these various disease areas for years and years to determine what's the likelihood that this is IgG mediated and that VivGuard will have a good chance of success. The second thing is we don't pioneer clinical endpoints or regulatory process. So we want a proven track record of what's worked for a clinical endpoint and a regulatory process. And then finally, the last thing, the unmet medical need. What the patient is in need for and is there a commercial capability behind it? We know that pricing right now globally has been soft. What are you seeing in terms of both uh, gross to net discounts in the U.S. and then pricing in general, XUS? Um, so we benefit from the fact that uh, we are showing overwhelming benefit in the ley line patients. So we can get pretty healthy uh, reimbursement pricing on that benefit. So I think the lesson here is that really you have to fulfill our medical need and then provide unmatched benefit to the patients. And then globally speaking, yes, uh, you're expecting the price to be somewhat uh, less in the rest of the world. However, again, we will go to all the agencies with our health economics uh, benefit analysis so that we'll have strong pricing based on the benefit we provide. Back in 2018, we declared that we're going to pursue a volume-driven growth strategy. The fact that we're now in over 100 markets around the world and able, able to diversify our geographic presence really helps. Now, in the U.S., there are other things happening, obviously, but we have seen, even just with competitive pressure, the PBMs and payers net price drag since 2018. Mm. And that's not an Amgen phenomenon, it's an industry phenomenon. And so even there, that volume-driven strategy and trying to access large pools of patients and treat them effectively with our therapies has been a very important part of the company strategy. Yeah, I can just tell you that reimbursement around the globe right now is changing probably more than it has in quite some time. If we look at the U.S., I would say with the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the other changes going in play, um, this is as much as we've seen since Part D was introduced back in 2000. You have changes going on to the Abnog process in Germany. France has a whole new process. Italy, a reorganization. Probably the biggest difference is the UK with the Brexit and, and now after that. Finally, Japan. Uh, Japan looks at products on an annual basis and asks for reduction. Uh, fortunately, we're working in the rare disease space with VivGuard, so there's minimal to no reduction, and we really don't expect any reduction for 2023. And really, all these governments, regardless of whether or not it's the U.S. or in Europe or wherever else, they're trying to find this balance, right, between ensuring patients have access to innovation, but also acknowledging the fact that prices are increasing and that the costs are growing, mm -hmm. and how do they then best marshal their, their resources. So what we've seen are things like the IRA, which I think are well-intended, uh, and, and you know we understand and support that patients need to have lower out-of-pocket costs. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's some unintended consequences that, that we're observing. Uh, and so if you think about a company bringing 
a novel indication uh, to market, one that's for a niche uh, indication, small group of patients, they may think twice now about doing that, uh, knowing that there could be a cost associated with doing that as they think about the larger indication and losing some of the revenue on the outer years. Um, that's not a position anybody wants to be in. We all want to be able to support providing you know, innovative medicines for patients with small indications. So I think that's an unintended consequence. Certainly, that, that was not really top of mind when the architects of the IRA were, were really bringing it uh, to, together. Yeah. The other that I'll touch on very quickly, it's more of a subtle point. There might be a shift now to more investment in biologics, which, as we all know, are less prone to price erosion from generic entry. Biosimilars don't have their prices drop as quickly as oral products. And so you may then see companies begin to invest more on, on, on biologics, again, ultimately potentially leading to less savings long term. Inflation Reduction Act passed Congress just a few months ago, and it's going to have uh, some impact and innovation in the future. Uh, Medicare can start negotiating pricing in 2026 for small molecules and 28 for injectables. How is that going to impact the way Legend uh, develops and markets drugs? Overall, I think it does put a damper on innovative uh, drug development because ultimately, uh, you know, it's very expensive and it's a very lengthy process to develop a new drug and we need to be paid for it and we need to return for the uh, shareholders. But on the other hand, we're very pleased that actually in the Inflation Reduction Act, plasma-derived product is uh, exempted. So I have a short answer that is uh, Carvicti will be exempted from the Inflation Reduction Act. It doesn't really do a lot for patients. And that, that's really the, the disappointing part of this legislation. It, it takes quite a bit of value out of our industry, but doesn't give it back to patients who would actually benefit from it. Fortunately, Amgen's a biologics company for the most part, and biologics are treated slightly differently in the Inflation Reduction Act bill and fa more favorably than small molecules. So that helps our company a little bit in the implementation of this. But changes that I think are going to make it challenging for some PBMs who have a lot of Part D beneficiaries in their book of business, they're going to want to skinny those formularies down because they're now on the hook and, and catastrophic for 60% of that, that bill, that patient cost. So that I worry a little bit about and causing harm to patients who are Medi Medicare Part D beneficiaries. But, you know, I think what we also do well at Amgen is we take whatever the new dynamic is in the market, we run it all the way back into our research, our development, commercialization process to make sure that we're developing products that can return a good value for our shareholders when they make it to market in that new environment. Each country really has, you know, a different way of doing things. Some of them follow similar suit. What we've done as a company is try to focus on delivering, you know, access to our product as quickly as we can. If we use Brookins as an example, we've actually made the decision to, you know, perhaps forego eking out another three to five percent in the spirit of really trying to get our, our medicines to patients as quickly as we can, because we think that overall that's best for patients, is best for business too. You know, I think it's a responsible decision that you have to have access to innovative medicines. And really, this is a call to companies like ours to continue to be innovative. And we do this with the patient at the core of everything that we focus on. We keep it science-based and make it uh, truly about how we can impact patients through new mechanisms of action. And then, you know, lastly, this is something that um, it is asking all of our industry to innovate more and innovate faster. We'll continue, continue to evaluate our indications and our products as we move forward with the IRA, but right now it's a call to action. Keith, always great to see you. As we wrap up a super rainy week here in San Francisco, kicking off 2023, there are three major themes that clearly emerge from all our discussions with management teams. Number one, when launching a new product, innovation and differentiation are key to securing great reimbursement placement and formulary access. Two, unfortunately, the pricing dynamics continue to be weak pretty much globally. It's now pretty clear that gross to net pricing discounts in the US are widening, and that's something we've been covering extensively in our work, partly driven by formulary access discounts and 340B pricing discounts. Uh, increasingly, as you know, in Europe, pricing is soft, and we're now seeing that pretty clearly in Japan and obviously in China. And then three, the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, is obviously going to have profound implications and innovation near and far. Number one, it's going to provide an incentive for companies to develop biosimilars um, in cases where that's possible. Number two, it's going to provide incentive to developing biologics over small molecules. And then three, there are cases that because of a pricing negotiation, there's going to be less incentive to launching generics and biosimilars. Well, it's been a great week. We hope we really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. 
We're head over to Tahoe. They got two feet of snow last night.